Um, hi there. Um, hello, everybody. How are you? So thus far, it looks like everything is normal tonight. I don't know what was going on last night, but there was a problem between my StreamYard software and Facebook. There was no problem between uh, my computer and StreamYard. That was all right but I don't know what happened. I'm hoping it does not happen again. So here's hoping. <laughs> anyway, hi to you all. Hi Dolores, hi Lana. Hey Kay. Um, hi Andrew Hiller. Please uh, share, share, share. By the way, I see you've been doing some of that. Thank you. Jim Bird has joined. Hi, Jim. And Bonnie's here. Hi, honey. Also, Lana says, I was kicked out three times last night. Yeah, I know. Uh, I was kicked out a few times myself. There were interruptions in the stream, and so finally I gave it up. There was something wrong, and there was no way to unsnarl it because it was between StreamYard and Facebook. And I don't have control over that. That's what happened last night, anyway, as far as I know. So there was a topic I did not finish last night. And that was the topic of how can we pay for it. And how can we pay for it is now starting to get into the mainstream um, in a way that it has not gotten in before, I think, oh, when I say the mainstream, it actually got into a bill that was offered by Rashida Tlaib, and it also got into a New York Times article by Stephanie Kelton. So we're going to go over these two articles tonight, and then we're going to also go over a critique uh, Okay, and the critique is of the new Senate um, stimulus bill, they're calling it, but I call it a stabilization bill, because what's going on, okay, at this point is that the economy is in free fall because of the shutdown uh, which is caused by the coronavirus. So it's a straightforward impact of the virus. Uh, and, of course, the economic system is very brittle and cannot take shocks like that. So there needed to be a stabilization bill. I'm not calling it a stimulus bill because I don't think that what the senators are trying to do is to create really broad prosperity in the population and really make the economy boom and grow for everybody. But I think what they're trying to do is to stop the fall. So I'm calling it a stabilization bill. Anyway, with that as an introduction, I want to show you uh, the effort by Rashida Tlaib. share the screen in order to do that. And what I'm showing you is a PDF that was put out there by Rashida Tlaib, a congresswoman from the Michigan 13th District which is in and around uh, the Detroit area. And part of it is in the city of Detroit, and part of it is in uh, some of the suburban areas. Okay, Inkster, for example. Uh, and... Uh, 
uh, she introduced um, but she introduced a new bill called the Automatic Booster Communities Act. And she describes it in a summary as in response to the coronavirus crisis, the Automatic Boost Communities Act would immediately provide a U.S. debit card preloaded with $2,000 to every person in America. Each card would be recharged with $1,000 monthly until one year after the end of the coronavirus uh, the crisis. So, what this bill would provide is basically uh, um, but first of all, a shot in the arm because it would be 2,000 to every person in America. So, for a family of four, that would be $8,000. For a family of two, it would be $4,000. There are no qualifications here. It's every person in America. Each card would be recharged with $1,000 monthly. So that would be a basic income of $2,000 monthly for a family of two. So this is more generous than um, um, Andrew Yang's um, um, idea. Of course, it lasts for a shorter period okay, of time. But it's guaranteeing the universality of uh, the credits. And it says every person includes dependents and then goes into the scenario I described. In other words, four people in a family, $8,000 okay, in total. Non-citizens, including undocumented people, permanent residents, and temporary visitors whose stay exceeds uh, three months. Um, um, individuals who do not have a bank account, social security number, or permanent address. People living in unincorporated territories um, 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 or protectorates um, and Americans who are living abroad. So if you're in Spain, okay, and you're a couple, you'd be getting $2,000 to help you live um, in Spain. If you did a little work there too, uh, you'd probably have um, have a fair amount of money to, to travel in Spain okay, and to um, enjoy working there. To ensure that this program is as universal and comprehensive as possible, the U.S. Treasury will develop its list of eligible um, individuals in coordination with the Internal Revenue Service and the Social Security Administration, and the Federal Election Commission, and every other relevant federal, state, and local government agency, including state-level departments of um, um, the motor vehicles, the DMVs. And there's a section on distributing the money. The prepaid cards would be distributed as U.S. debit cards and would be administered by the U.S. Treasury's Bureau of the Fiscal Service. Uh, but um, I don't recall there being a Bureau of the Fiscal Service actually right now, so I think this act is going to create such a bureau. These prepaid uh, um, but digital cash cards could be used to withdraw physical currency at regular um, ATMs or FDIC-insured banks uh, by credit unions or make payments at point-of-sale terminals as well as online. Um, in addition, these cards could be topped up 
uh, with additional funds as needed during and after the crisis. So they would remain there as an instrumentality for the federal government to use every time it had to inject funds directed at people in the economy. All cardholder and interchange fees that are associated with use of distributed cards would be waived for the duration of the coronavirus crisis. The program would establish a common database of recipients identified by name and where available employer identification numbers, um, um, EINs. Identifying information would not be shared with any other federal, state, or local agency or any um, um, individual who receives, activates, and uses more than the maximum number of cards authorized for themselves um, and their dependents, either as a as a result of fraud or administrative um, error, would have excess funds reclaimed in the future via appropriate mechanisms, i.e. tax refund uh, deductions. So, if you got too much, then what was given to you through these cards would be recouped at tax time. So there's no means testing uh, but um, 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 payments that are excessive in some way can be recouped through the tax uh, system. So it would not involve any additional bureaucracy. Let me check here and see how yeah, you are seeing of the page that was offered by Rashida. I'll make it a little bit more visible for you. And then it moves on to a second page. This is very short, so it's not going to take uh, um, okay, it's um, not going to take a hell of a long time. Cards would be distributed and distributed in three ways. One, um, uh, direct mail. All individuals with an active address on file with any government agency would have a card sent to them to that, um, to that address um, via the Postal Service. In-person pickup. Um, individuals who do not have a permanent address or otherwise cannot or do not receive their debit card by mail, including undocumented people, um, permanent residents, and temporary visitors, who stay exceeds three months, could also obtain one directly from any FDIC insured bank or credit union or temporary card uh, um, distribution stations that would be placed at local offices and U.S. embassies um, overseas. And three, there would be an outreach to at-risk um, 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 people there would be a dedicated emergency responder corps which would perform outreach to at-risk populations, including people who are elderly, homeless, physically disabled, or live in remote areas to ensure they receive their debit card and to simul simultaneously perform a general wellness check in case they need additional targeted assistance. So this is really innovative and it wants to include everybody. It's about including everybody. It's about giving everybody a boost. And it also considers how the program would be funded. How are you going to pay for it? The Automatic Boost to Communities Act would be a money-financed fiscal program for which no additional U.S. debt would be issued. Instead, the program would be funded directly from the Treasury. 
using its legal authority to create money via coin seniorage, which is a statutory delegation of Congress's constitutional power of the purse. The mechanics of this funding approach would be as follows. So Rashida is saying here, this is not going to be done through taxing. This is not going to be done through issuing debt instruments. This is going to be done by the Treasury Secretary directing the U.S. Mint to issue two $1 trillion platinum coins under the legal authority provided by Section, uh, I'm sorry, Chapter 31 um, of the U.S. Code, um, Paragraph 5112K. Uh, and that is the paragraph that empowers the Treasury Secretary to direct uh, the Mint to issue platinum coins whose face value can be specified at the discretion of the secretary. That face value could be a trillion dollars, it could be $50, it could be $100, could be $10,000, could be $100 trillion. There is a book about the platinum coin, one book that has been written about it so far. I am the author of that book. So, if you go to josephmfirestone.com and you look for the book called Fixing the Debt, etc., 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 that is the only book written about the platinum coin. And it's a pretty comprehensive treatment. So you can learn about it in detail there. For our purposes tonight, uh, what you have to know are the bullet points being specified here. Congress would uh, direct the Federal Reserve to purchase the newly issued coins at full face value. How would Congress do that? Because the direction would be included in the bill. What you're looking at here is a summary of the bill, actually, or a blurb on the bill. It's not the legislative language itself. But the legislative language is in the bill directing of the Federal Reserve to purchase the newly issued coins at full face value. Why is that something necessary? Well, I don't think it really is necessary. Uh, but there has been some controversy concerning uh, whether uh, the Federal Reserve would have to credit such coins it's reported, though we don't know if it's accurate or not, that during the Obama administration, when minting platinum coins to get around the debt ceiling bill uh, was um, um, under discussion, that the chairperson of the Board of Governors of the Fed said, uh, well, if you give such a coin to us, we're just not going to credit it. I don't know whether that's true. I do know that if the Treasury Secretary insisted that the Federal Reserve actually credit uh, the coin, then the chairperson of the Federal Reserve would have had to comply or that chairperson could be fired for cause by the executive branch. Because the Fed law says that where interpretations of uh, financial matters differ between the Secretary of the Treasury and the chairperson of the Board of Governors um, of the Fed, the interpretation 
favored by the Treasury Secretary, uh, will prevail. That in those situations of disagreement, that has greater authority, according to the Fed law, than the interpretation that would be provided by the chairperson of the Fed. Now, of course, uh, to do things on that basis would be uncomfortable, you know, make everybody uncomfortable. So basically, what the Rashida wanted to do here was to short circuit uh, that issue by just having Congress direct uh, the Fed to purchase the newly issued coins at full face value. Okay, so what happens then? Uh, okay, well, actually, the bullet points following, um, I'll go into it into a sufficient amount of detail. The Federal Reserve would complete the purchase by crediting the U.S. Mint's account at the Fed with $2 trillion in uh, reserves. What are reserves? Okay, reserves are just additions to the account balance of the U.S. Mint's account. So, for example, if the U.S. Mint's account, uh, the public enterprise um, the fund account, uh, for the sake of argument, let's say, had uh, maybe a million dollars in it or something like that, uh, what that bullet points means is that the Federal Reserve would complete the, the purchase by adding $2 trillion to the account balance of the Mint in the public enterprise fund account uh, at the New York uh, Federal Reserve Bank. That's what uh, that particular bullet point um, actually means. Okay. So what happens to the coin? Okay, the next bullet point takes care of that. The Fed would retain um, ownership of the two $1 trillion coins permanently in order to ensure its own balance sheet remains fully capitalized by the Treasury. In other words, so as not to harm the balance sheet of the Fed. The accounting record um, at the Fed would show $2 trillion worth, okay, of assets. If it were broken down further, then, okay, it would show that the Fed was holding in its vaults two $1 trillion coins. Okay, so that's it. The Fed would not actually be creating money, okay, in this instance, what it would be do, doing is um, 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 but taking a monetary asset from the Treasury, the $2 trillion coins, which are already U.S. money, and crediting the Treasury spending account with $2 trillion, I'm sorry, uh, the Mint's account with $2 trillion in uh, reserves. $2 trillion more in that account. Next, the Treasury Secretary would sweep the newly created reserve funds from the Mint's account into the regular Treasury General account. The Treasury General account is the formal name of the Treasury spending account. It's where most spending from the federal government comes out of, that particular account. It is resident at the New York Fed, by the way. Okay, what does sweep actually mean here? Okay, what it means is that uh, the new funds that were placed in the account uh, would not all be available to the Treasury Secretary. Um, specifically, only what is known as the coin seniorage would be available to the secretary. So what is the coin seniorage? It's the profit that would have been made on the coin when the Fed credited uh, the Mint's account. How much profit would that be? It would be the total of the $2 trillion coins, $2 trillion, 
but minus the expenses the mint uh, incurred in producing the $2 trillion coins, transporting it up to the New York Fed and depositing it at uh, the Fed. There would be costs, okay, associated with that, roughly, let's say, $3,500, $4,000, something in that range. So the Treasury would sweep $2 trillion minus $4,000, in other words, nearly $2 trillion, right into the Treasury general account. And the Treasury would make the funds available to the Bureau of the Fiscal Service to disperse to every person in America in the form of the prepaid U.S. Uh, uh, by debit uh, by, uh, uh, by cards. So the funds then would stay in the Treasury general account, but these cards that would be issued by the Bureau of the Fiscal Service would be drawing on the regular uh, Treasury general account. So that's the way that would work. So Rashida says in her descriptor, this approach would preserve the historical separation between fiscal policy uh, 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 and monetary policy and avoid financial entanglement between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, which would eventually undermine the independence of the Fed. So that particular sentence is there to satisfy people who were worried about uh, the um, independence of the Fed and the issue of undermining the independence of the Fed. So that's why that's put in there. In the long term, the card um, infrastructure should be converted into a permanent treasury-administered digital public currency wallet system to serve as a privacy-respecting e-cash complement to universal Fed accounts and or postal bank accounts um, for all. So this is really forward-looking, isn't it? In other words, it assumes that at some time in the future, there might be universal Fed accounts for everybody and or postal bank accounts for everybody that we all could have. So this proposal is very forward-looking. It uses digital currency, but also public currency. It uses an electronic wallet system. And it's going to be able to serve as a complement. Sorry, I see my camera has gone out. I will fix that. Some reason.
Okay, I seem to be back. I seem to be in. And hopefully I'm still sharing my screen. No, I'm going to have to share it again. So it kicked me out of there. I'm not sure why. That's what I keep hearing. Someone needs to find that out. Yep, I see you, Carmen says. Good, Carmen. Thank you very much. I see me too. So that's good. So let me go back to the description of the act. The final line of it is this proposal should be accompanied by progressive tax reform to ensure that um, emergency relief um, 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 provisioning does not exacerbate income or wealth um, inequality in the long term. So, this act was written by Rashida Tlaib with uh, very in-depth, uh, and her staff, with very in-depth consultation from uh, uh, by Rohan Gray, who is the president of the Modern Money Network, and also he's getting a doctorate in law at uh, Cornell, okay, at this point. And he's very well known, okay, in MMT circles. He does great work. He recently did a very excellent paper, okay, on MMT. That includes a very good section on the coin. Uh, so anyway, this is a terrific bill. Of course, it was never seriously considered. But it's in there for debate. It's been introduced. The idea of platinum coin seniorage has been introduced into the Congress in a favorable context, in a favorable context, as a means of actually funding um, an economic um, stabilization bill for the first time okay, in history. So this is a historical occurrence, okay, that you're seeing. Now, it got short shrift, actually, this time around, because what happened is Nancy Pelosi passed a bill that was really extremely inadequate. It used, uh, it was very heavy on means testing in terms of what it was going to give out to people. <clears throat> It did not use the concept of a basic income, okay, at all. Uh, it was a really backward-looking bill. It wouldn't have been enough. When the bill went to the Senate, instead of basically passing the bill and going ahead with it, what the Senate did was to write a bill um, of its own. Okay, and it was a bill written by McConnell and his forces that had some goodies in it for people, but that was basically and only a huge giveaway to the corporations. And we'll get into that, okay, in a little while. There was a lot of fighting over that bill in the Senate. And the Democrats blocked it, okay, a couple of times because they were very, very opposed to it. So McConnell had to negotiate with Schumer to pass the Senate bill. 
and McConnell made a lot of concessions, but he also got a lot of what um, he wanted. And we'll be going over that bill, okay, a little bit later. But the important thing, okay, about the Rashida bill is, first of all, that okay, it proposed a basic income, that it, okay, was generous And that it answered the how you're going to pay for it question, which people would inevitably raise since it was a progressive bill and was not a bill being passed or being introduced with bipartisan support in either the House or the Senate. Okay, now, of course, nobody has quite raised the issue of how the Senate is going to pay for the bill, which it was in the process of passing this evening. Now, uh, I don't know whether the bill actually passed. Uh, when I began here tonight, it had not passed as yet. A lot of people were speaking in favor of it. All the senators were going to have a chance to speak. I don't know how long that was going to go on. However, McConnell and Schumer were pretty determined to pass that bill tonight. So we know that the Rashida Tlaib bill is unlikely at this point to get into the mix. It's too bad, because this is one great bill. And you could see that it would bail out the people who needed to be bailed out because the economy was shutting down. Specifically, people every person in the country. It wasn't about a bailout for the corporations um, um, at all. It was about fulfilling the need of those who had a need. Then there was a second piece that also appeared. This one was in the Times. And this one was by Stephanie Kelton. And let me share this one with you too. Okay, now Stephanie is certainly one of the uh, most favorite uh, when it comes to uh, to MMTers uh, um, she's extremely popular and when it comes to non-MMTers too she's extremely popular and she's now a force because she gets into all sorts of mainstream uh, publications. So here she takes one of the um, ideas that she most likes to talk about okay, and to write about. And the title of the article is, Just Use, Quote, The Computer at the Fed to Give People More Money. And you see a nice picture of the Capitol here. Well, you should see that as I share this. Yep, I think you did see it. So what she has to say there is that to you know, stem the tide of the coronavirus transmission or flatten the curve, we have to practice um, social distancing. And because of this, because of the need to stay home, job losses are quickly mounting. Millions of people are starting to fear the worst, okay, for their families. And as I told you last time, okay, I was on, last week, ending March 21st, there were 3.4 million people who were applying for unemployment insurance across the United States. It was estimated. 
3.4 million people became unemployed last week and the week ending March 21st. Who knows what will happen in the week ending March the 28th? That's this week. We have to wait and see. But as I said then, the unemployment rate went up by 2% in one week from 3.5% to 5.5%. One of Donald Trump's favorite things was ruined. He can't talk about his wonderful 3.5% unemployment numbers anymore. So Stephanie says, people going into unemployment doesn't have to be our fate. But it's going to require policymakers to manage the fallout of the coronavirus effectively. And that will mean not falling prey to the austerity fallacies that arose in the wake of the 2008 meltdown and the recession that followed. With the COVID-19 pandemic now threatening to last for up to 18 months, Congress this week passed and Mr. Trump signed a bipartisan emergency relief bill worth billions of dollars. The White House is pushing another bill with $1 trillion in new spending. That package would almost certainly push the federal deficit above $2 trillion. And if history is any lesson, deficit hawks will try to pull back on the fiscal reins if it becomes law to largely call it a day. And she goes through Senator Warren talking to Chris Hayes of MSNBC. Let's learn what we should have learned from the 2008 crash, said Senator Warren. When we do a stimulus package, it needs to be big enough to meet the moment. And she worried. If we fail to do that, we're not going to get a second bite at it from a political standpoint. She offered $750 billion as an appropriate number for a stimulus package. And the minority leader of the Senate, Chuck Schumer, reportedly agreed. But then Schumer went ahead and worked with the Republicans to come up with a $2 trillion bill, which, by the way, they haven't said how they were going to pay for that $2 trillion bill. So Stephanie says, the question before us then is how to avoid a repeat, a better civic understanding of how Congress can be just as ambitious in its fiscal spending for people as the Federal Reserve is for the banking and credit system uh, may help. Um, that is the better understanding may help. And so she pro she proceeds to provide that. Uh, during the 2008 crisis, the Federal Reserve sprang into action. It poured trillions of dollars into the financial system in less than a week. It provided short-term loans to bank. It slashed the key interest rate virtually to zero. It announced the Fed would begin buying $700 billion worth of U.S. government bonds and mortgage-backed securities. Then after all that, the Fed gave itself the authority to purchase up to $1 trillion in commercial paper to support the flow okay, of credit. In other words, it bought assets in return for reserves. How did it create uh, those reserves. Stephanie said, I tweeted an eight-second video from 2009 um, by showing Ben um, 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 Bernanke, the Fed chair at the time, explaining how the central bank comes up with the money to pull off these trillion-dollar maneuvers. Quote, it's not tax money, unquote, Mr. Bernanke explained on 60 Minutes. 
and there is a little video of that here. Okay, I'm not going to try to play it because I'm not sure whether it's going to play through. Uh, there may be some echoes there. But anyway, it's only an eight-second video. And the question which was asked was, where did the Federal Reserve get the $1.45 trillion they just committed to um, um, injecting? And Ben said, okay, Ben Bernanke said, it isn't uh, tax money, he explained. We simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account. Quote, um, unquote. Stephanie says, heads exploded. The clip drew over a million views and thousands of comments. Many people replying to the tweet complain that we're repeating the mistakes of 2008 to uh, 2009, coming to the rescue of Wall Street instead of Main Street. If the Fed can do this for the banks, they wondered, why can't we find the money to pay for programs that would improve life for everyday Americans? She says when she read through the comments, she was taught two lessons. One, most people simply aren't aware that the Fed doles out money using nothing more than a computer. To buy financial assets or lend to a bank, the Fed simply keystrokes uh, by digital dollars, formerly known as bank reserves, into existence, or as we often say, creates the additional dollars out of thin air. It does this not just in uh, an emergency, but each and every day, yes, when it adds to the Treasury spending account, whatever comes before the addition, when it adds to the Treasury spending account, it does so by keystroking new dollars to add to the balance in the Treasury spending account so that the Treasury doesn't run out of money when it has to spend what Congress has ordered the Treasury to spend. Okay. And then two, she learned, people are worried about how they will pay their bills if their incomes fall off a cliff. They see trillions of dollars popping into existence to help uh, Wall Street, and yes, to stabilize markets in general, but they don't see the Fed doing anything to directly support uh, Main Street. A lot of people said some version of, quote, I sure wish the Fed would mark up the size of my bank account, unquote. What they're missing is that the Federal Reserve doesn't have the authority to procure ventilators, to declare a moratorium on mortgage and tax payments, or to send checks to every American. Only Congress can direct um, 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 those actions. So you may ask, then why does the Fed have the authority to buy these financial assets and to trade basically its reserves for these financial assets? And the answer is the Fed already has that authority from Congress. That's part of the way the Fed has been doing business since Congress uh, started it. It has the authority to swap assets with the private sector banks. It takes assets purportedly having a certain value from the private sector banks and it trades uh, reserves. It gives those banks or those private sector actives, it gives them its reserves instead. Now, its reserves are high-powered uh, federal money. They're government money. The most trustworthy money in the United States. The assets they take are not necessarily so trustworthy, but that's the way things roll, okay, in this country. The Fed is making these trades um, but all the time. It has the authority to make these trades. But it doesn't have the authority to buy ventilators. 
or declare a moratorium on mortgage and tax payments or send the checks to every American. And Steph says, still an often muddled, even politically hidden truth is that when called upon, the same computer that works for large banks is there for Main Street as well. But the Federal Reserve needs specific instructions before typing up dollars for the rest of us. And here she says, those instructions come in the form of uh, the legislation. When a bill becomes a law, the government is in essence telling the Fed how many dollars it is ordering up to cover um, health care expenses, child care costs, or replace lost uh, wages, and so on. Um, and, says Stephanie, this is crucial. All spending, whether or not it is offset by tax increases, is covered by the Federal Reserve. Um, and what is crucial is that the spending that's done by the federal government as a matter of routine these days goes through the Treasury spending account. And it goes from the Treasury spending account to the recipients through the Federal Reserve System because the Treasury spending account is sitting at the New York Fed, the Treasury General account, is sitting at the New York Fed. The most fiscally responsible way for Congress to support the economy now is with higher deficit spending until it is no longer needed. Why? Because private demand could be weak for the next 18 months or so. In such a case, it's crucial to prevent premature attempts to make our deficit smaller. As the economy recovers and consumers and businesses get back in the game, Congress can safely withdraw support, handing the reins back to the private sector. The degree to which Congress relief efforts actually reach working families depends upon how effectively lawmakers of goodwill can fend off the various industry interest groups that will attempt to eat up as much of the allotments as they can. Congress should not just settle for short-term band-aids to patch holes in our health care infrastructure and our social safety nets. It can and should use this opportunity to make ambitious, lasting um, improvements. Well, Congress has done some good things in this uh, Senate bill, okay, but it has not really made ambitious and lasting improvements, as we shall see. But to go on. Uh, the large deficits in the likely oncoming uh, recession, and they will be large, whether the result of government action or care inaction, should be calmly accepted. There's no risk of a Greek-style debt crisis because unlike the Greeks, whose currency is the euro, the U.S. government maintains control of a sovereign currency, the most powerful one um, on earth, um, uh, right now, anyway. We are not going to, quote, run out of money, unquote, as President Obama once declared during the Great uh, Recession. And then Stephanie makes uh, the critical point. And here I'm going to take you back to the earlier point that she made. The earlier point was still an often muddled, even politically hidden truth is that when called upon, the same computer that works for large banks is there for Main Street as well. But the Federal Reserve needs specific instructions before typing up dollars for the rest of us. And she says those instructions come in the form of legislation. She says, when a bill becomes law, the government is in essence telling the Fed how many dollars it is ordering up to cover health care expenses, child care costs, replace lost wages, and so on. And this is crucial, all spending, whether or not it is offset by tax increases, is covered by the Federal Reserve. Now, all that is right, but it glosses over the point 
that the instructions to top up the Treasury spending account when it's running low so that the Treasury can make the expenses through its Treasury spending account don't come uh, from the legislation. They don't come from the legislation. Right now, the instructions to top up the Treasury spending account come from bank settlements in which the Federal Reserve is settling tax payments that were made to the Treasury Department and bond auction sales that were realized by uh, the Treasury Department. When the Fed goes through the settlement of those, the business rules followed by the Fed say, once you have in the process of marking down, of settling the bank transactions that remove the tax dollars from the accounts of those who paid the taxes and that remove the dollars from the private sector used to purchase uh, the, uh, the bonds, that when that settlement is taking place, there are business rules that provide the instructions to the Fed to then create new money in the Treasury spending account. And those are the two main business rules that exist at this point that trigger the additions of new reserves to the Treasury spending account so that the Treasury can spend. Now, what was going on in the Rashida Tlaib situation? Okay, before we get to the final point okay, of this article. What was going on in that particular situation? Okay. In that particular situation, there was a new business rule being propounded, actually, by Congress. What Congress was doing was ordering the Federal Reserve, when it received uh, the deposit of a trillion-dollar coin, or really two trillion-dollar coins, um, from the mint uh, to buy those coins and to pay for them with uh, reserves that were going into the account of the mint. And then there's another business rule which the Fed has now. And that business rule is that when the Treasury sweeps the mint's account for the coin senior unit, the Fed is mandated to deposit the coin seniorage into the Treasury spending account. That rule exists now. It occurs. It doesn't produce a heck of a lot of seniorage every year. It's in the millions of dollars in seniorage, but it's not in the billions of dollars. I think it's something like five hundred million a year or something like that in seniorage that now goes into the Treasury spending account after the Treasury sweeps the public enterprise um, the fund account. But what Rashida was doing in, in her bill, uh, with the assistance okay, of Rohan Gray, was to say, hey, Fed, here is a new instruction. It's coming from us, the Congress. We who created you in the first place, we are ordering you to buy these coins and to credit the Mint's account with the face value of these coins. A new rule a new instruction for the Fed. That's what was going on there. But now, Stephanie Kelton's final point. This is a good, as good a moment as any for the American people to learn 
where money comes from and why the federal government and only the federal government has the means to step up and save the economy. Congress has all the firepower it needs. It just needs to send instructions to the Fed and the money will go out. But what kind of instructions to the Fed? What kind of instructions to the Fed should it send out? Stephanie doesn't say what those instructions are. If it just passes the normal appropriations type okay, of legislation, there are no instructions in there for the Fed to mark up the Treasury spending account. It's just expected that it will mark up the Treasury spending account uh, when it settles tax transactions, when it settles bond transactions. And when it settles um, the seniorage transactions, perhaps. And when it settles transactions involving sales of property, which the government makes. But in the appropriations bills themselves, or the other money bills, there are generally no specific instructions for the Fed to top up, to add reserves to the Treasury spending account. And that account can run low. It can go lower than $5 billion, which the Treasury doesn't like it to go lower than $5 billion. But it can get lower than $5 billion. And then the Treasury seeks to add to it. And that's often when it does uh, securities auctions, or the Treasury auctions actually held by the Fed in order to facilitate the sale of the Treasury bonds. However, when the debt ceiling, when the debt ceiling is approached by uh, the Treasury Department, it then cannot hold those auctions because when it holds those auctions, it's going to increase the debt. And there are no instructions in the appropriations bills about what the Treasury should do then to top up its account so it can spend uh, the appropriations that Congress is mandating that the Treasury spend. So she's perfectly right here. It just needs to send instructions to the Fed and the money will go out. That is absolutely true. But uh, the question arises. What is the language that is to apply here. Let's find that language. That language is the language of what I call um, overt congressional financing. And let me see if I can show you that. I will try. If this is working properly, I'll be able to do it. Ah, yes. It is working properly. So you should be able to see it now.
啊。have it in the wrong place so let me see if I can do this I'm gonna have to share it again because I was sharing it in the wrong window didn't give you as good a view as I wanted you to have so let me see if I can do that again and get you a better view There we go. So the language is, and you should be able to see it on your screen now, it should be uh, highly visible. The title of the slide says, Create Overt Congressional Financing. And the language is, and this language would go into every appropriations bill. It would say, upon passage of this appropriations bill, the Federal Reserve is directed to fill the Treasury spending account at the New York um, Federal Reserve with the addition to its reserve balance necessary to spend uh, this appropriation. So that would be the language in the appropriations bill. The appropriations bill would be sent over by the Congress to the Fed. And this language would be in it. And these are the instructions. Second paragraph. Um, in addition, actually second sentence and second paragraph. In addition, the Federal Reserve is directed to fill the Treasury spending account with the additions to the Treasury reserve balances necessary to repay all outstanding debt instruments including principal and interest, as they fall due for the fiscal year of this appropriation. Now that's it. Those are the instructions. They take care of paying for, of, okay, they take care of uh, how much the Treasury spending account has to be marked up to spend the appropriations of the Congress, and they take care of the amount the Treasury spending account has to be marked up in order to repay all outstanding debt instruments falling due within the period of the appropriation. It means all of the so-called national debt falling due within the period of the appropriation would also be paid back. So, each appropriation bill that's passed each year would pay back more and more and more of the debt. That turns out a lot of debt turns over in one year. There'd probably be six to seven, seven trillion dollars worth of the national debt being repaid in the first year. So we no longer would owe, um, people are so worried, federal government owes $23 trillion in debt. That debt would probably be repaid within the first year that this process was going on. But there is 30-year debt outstanding okay, that the Treasury Department has. It's not a lot, but there is some 30-year debt. So, to get the national debt down to zero might take 30 years, but after just a few months, it would be apparent to the public that there is no debt problem. There is no public debt problem. It can be easily handled by the Treasury Department and by Congress, if Congress chooses to do it. All that Congress has to do is send the instructions to send the instructions, as Stephanie says. It just needs to send instructions to the Fed and the money will go out. How can it send the instructions? Include those two paragraphs um, in the appropriations bill 
send a copy to the chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and ask the chair to distribute these instructions to everybody at the New York Federal Reserve Bank who does any processing at all with the Treasury spending account. That is all okay, that has to be done. So now you know not only that Congress needs to send instructions to the Fed, but now you also know what kinds of instructions it has to send to the Fed. Not simply the instructions of the bill itself, but sending a bill with instructions inside of it um, telling the Fed when to top up the Treasury spending account so that Treasury will have the money it needs to spend all the appropriations that Congress has passed. So now you know about the fact that it needs to send instructions and also what the content of those instructions uh, should be. So that's it. I've caught up to last night. <laughs> of course, I've been on for an hour and 10 minutes already. Sorry about that. But I wanted to get that crystal clear. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it is not a problem. Is not, is not a problem. So, okay, I do want to turn, I do want to turn to the bill going through the Senate. Okay, um, I don't know if it's going to get through the Senate right now. There were people dragging their feet on this. So I'm not sure it's going to sail through. When it gets through the Senate, I'm not sure it's going to sail through the House because some people are very upset at this bill, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the squad. They think it's too much of a bailout for business. Now, this article in the American Prospect by David um, Badean will explain to you why they're so exercised, so upset. title of the article is Unsanitized. And the subtitle is um, Unsanitized, a tradition unlike um, any other. Tradition here in the United States unlike any other. He first goes over what happened 12 years ago in 2008 when the banks asked for a bailout after years of irresponsible, highly leveraged um, lending and trading, and trading. Because the Wall Streeters were trading in highly innovative debt instruments that hid the actual insecurity of these instruments, these financial instruments. That they were bubble blowers, basically. And what was inside was crap. <laughs> and the Treasury Department put out a three-page term sheet seeking money from Congress with no strings attached, even eliminating judicial review. Democrats balked. They called it a slush fund and worse. Then agreed after a few mostly meaningless bits of oversight and some promises to help ordinary people that $700 billion bailout was window dressing for trillions that came from the Federal Reserve, but it kept Congress quiet. 
hooking them into the rescue of the system. Okay. In other words, that 700 billion bailout, uh, that was the TARP. But that stood in for trillions of other dollars that came from the Federal Reserve to actually produce the real bailout of the banks, which was in excess of $30 trillion in credit facilities extended to the banks from 2008 going forward to at least 2012 when it was discovered by some graduate students working with, uh, with Randy Ray that up to that time, 29 trillion in credit facilities had been extended to the banks and the extensions of credit hadn't ended. God knows what they are by now. I don't think they ever ended. And the banks, of course, are playing games with these extensions of credit at extremely low interest rates. So anyway, what the Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin today tried to do is, um, in the stimulus bill they're trying to pass now, the stabilization bill, I should say, okay, they're trying to pass now, Virtually the same thing is taking place. After just a couple of weeks of extreme social distancing measures, the Treasury Department asked for a large bailout, this time of the entire corporate sector. Not the people, the entire corporate sector. The bill as written initially would have made all bailout activities secret for six months. Democrats balked, called it a slush fund and worse, and then agreed, Schumer, Schumer just agreed, and the Democrats are in the process okay, of agreeing to a few mostly meaningful bits of oversight and some promises to help um, ordinary people. In fact, they're the same bits of oversight from the 2008 uh, TARP um, the bailout. There's a five-member oversight panel and an inspector general for the program. By the way, these bits of oversight were written into the bill with the assistance of Senator Elizabeth Warren, that flaming progressive we all know about, who's introducing these controls on the secretary that had absolutely no effect at all in 2008. She's basically introducing the same kinds of controls again in 2020 oblivious to the fact that they didn't work at all in 2008 to control the Secretary of the Treasury. That is uh, Tim Geithner, in very short order, starting from the early part of 2009. These bits of oversight did not control him at all. He did what he wanted to, and he extended these trillions and trillions of dollars in credit to the big banks to allow them to become prosperous again and to allow the execs to get their bonuses again year after year after year. As for the current bill, Dave says, the enormity of this bailout is being underreported. The number you're hearing is 500 billion. Of that, 75 billion goes to the airline industry and the mysteriously named, quote, businesses critical to national security, unquote. The other $425 billion helps capitalize a $4.25 trillion with a T leveraged lending facility at the Federal Reserve. The taxpayer dollars would soak up any losses from that uh, by lending program. That's what it's for. That's what the $425 billion is for. 
It's to soak up um, any losses that might come from the bank's uh, lending program. Who are they going to lend to? In a lot of cases, they're going to lend to corporations that have continued their bad behavior for the last 12 years and that are now in trouble and require a bailout again. And $425 billion would not be enough for them. So they need to leverage the $425 billion by 10 times. And so Dave asks, and he points out, the loans won't be so secret anymore, but the oversight is largely after the fact without subpoena power and mainly reduced to writing reports. He asks, how exactly do you expect a small underfunded panel to find fraud in a $4.25 trillion lending facility, especially when the current administration explicitly believes they're not required to turn over anything to the Congress? And then Dave concludes, so it's not a $2 trillion bill. It's closer to $6 trillion. And 4.3 trillion of it comes in the form in the form of a bazooka aimed at CEOs and shareholders with almost no conditions attached. Well, what does Dave mean by that? Well, what he means is these loans can be used by the banks and other large businesses um, involved to acquire many smaller companies that have gotten in trouble because of the coronavirus contraction of the economy. It will put many smaller businesses, fairly large businesses themselves, but many smaller businesses and the banks that are getting this particular facility smaller than them, the contraction in the economy is going to expose them to acquisitions by the big fish who have access to the $4.3 trillion in lending facilities. That's why it's a bazooka aimed at CEOs and shareholders. It has almost no conditions attached except for this oversight thing, but nothing written in in terms of conditions that are attached to it. Like, for example, how about a share? How about a share in the companies that are getting all this bailout money? Okay, and Dave says, and he wrote this before this afternoon, at that time, at the moment, nobody's seen language. But there's apparently only a buyback ban, a buyback ban of one stock, for the term of the loan. The money can and can therefore go to executive compensation or mergers or wholesale purchases of distressed businesses or whatever other financial engineering the accounting department can muster. And once the economy returns to health, it can leak out cash to investors and during the loan too in dividends. There's no requirement to keep workers hired. In fact, the necessary provision to boost unemployment insurance for four months for to 100% of median salary, including furloughed workers, gig workers, and freelancers, means that these companies can fire people with relative impunity. But members of Trump's family can't get bailout funds. So, uh, yay, says Dave, yay. And then he says, this is a robbery in progress, and it's not a bailout for the coronavirus. It's a bailout for 12 years of corporate irresponsibility that made these companies so fragile that a few weeks of disruption would destroy them. The short-termism and lack of capital reserves funneled uh, the record profits into a bathtub of cash for investors. That's who's being made whole. 
um, um, financiers and the small slice of the public that owns more than a trivial amount of stocks. In fact, they've already been made whole. Yesterday, Wall Street got the word that they'd be saved, and stocks and bonds went wild. Uh, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, is running these bailout programs for the Fed and could explicitly profit if the Fed buys its funds, which it probably will. And Dave then says, this is a rubber stamp on an unequal system that has brought terrible hardship to the majority of America. The people get a $1,200 means-tested payment. Well, it's going to be means-tested after the fact, not before. So it's not going to hold up the payments this time. He says, the people will get a 1200 means-tested payment and a little wage insurance for four months. Corporations get a transformative amount of play money to sustain their system and wipe out the competition. Small businesses get their own program and can't participate in the $4.3 trillion bonanza. They get $300 billion. So do the math on who supported more. They get forgivable loans if they keep staff on payroll. But there's no such requirements for the corporates. While the Federal Reserve, which can transfer money from the cash cannon with ease, runs the corporate bailout, the hapless Small Business Administration will deal with the small businesses. They have been the Small Business Administration, the SBA. They have been endlessly, critic endlessly criticized for delays on their couple billion in loan guarantees, um, but, um, but let alone $300 billion. So the monopolists get concierge service, the small businesses get to take a number, and the result will almost certainly be massive concentration of economic uh, power. I'm quoting now from Dave, or almost quoting. He didn't say uh, it was economic power, he just said power, which may actually be more accurate because that kind of economic power, as we know, translates very heavily into political power, which is, by the way, why these big corporations are getting this bailout in the first place, because they own the Republican Party and a good part of the Democratic Party, too. Dave points out there's also $150 billion for state and local governments and $130 billion for hospitals, but he says, though not much for actual equipment, it seems to fix certain existing problems with their businesses. Anyway, progressives, he says, I've talked to on the Hill are apoplectic. Quote, temporary survival money for workers, trillions in permanent um, economic inequality, saving a bunch of executives and elites, said one House Democratic aide. There's particular anger reserved for the big show made of the House Democratic bill. A sideshow that never was part of the Senate side talks of their negotiations in the Senate. During this moment of unprecedented crisis, that's a quote from uh, Maurice B.P. Weeks, co-executive director of Action Center on Race okay, and the um, um, Economy. During this moment of unprecedented crisis, Who's valued by Donald Trump's cruel administration is becoming clearer than ever. Um, unquote. And Dave says that's true, but it's also true of the entire political system, not just Trump. Quote, um, Democratic leaders um, acceding to a Mnuchin managed lust fund reveal themselves to be too tired and spineless to be entrusted with power. Um, unquote. Jeff Hauser of the Revolving Door Project uh, rightly states. And then Dave goes on. This bill is an outrageous betrayal, a testament to how power works and saves itself, and Congress is about to put itself on the hook for it. Schumer has the center, Senate under this thumb, and he praised this bill at 2 a.m. this morning, so that's a done deal. Any House member could actually deny consent for the bill and stop this, but that would require getting to Washington, forcing everyone else back to Washington in the middle of a pandemic 
and delay what is needed if temporary relief for everyday people. I doubt anyone will do it. Nancy Pelosi purposely put this in place before turning to uh, remote voting to make such an action toxic. Democrats will instead whine from the sidelines as money pushed into the hand, is pushed into the hands of the corporate elites. That's the way they like it. No agency and ineffectual grandstanding. Someday, Larry Kudlow will write a book called Firefighting about how he saved the economy in between board meetings of the six companies left in the country and will wonder how things got so off track. Don't uh, wonder, he says. And that's it. That's the straight dope about uh, this particular bill. Now, yeah, it's going to be attractive in the short run for people getting bailed out. It's going to be attractive, okay, in the short run. If I recall correctly, there's going to be 1,200 for individuals um, in the bill. There's going to be $2,400 uh, for couples. There's going to be 500 for each uh, child. And those are the upfront payments. There's going to be four months of um, unemployment insurance. But this will be unemployment insurance, as Schumer says, on steroids. Because people will get near to their full salary. And if they're not on furloughs from companies, but are already unemployed, and don't have a full salary, they'll get $600 a week uh, m added to their unemployment checks. $600 a week is $2,600 a month for as long as the coronavirus crisis happens to last, they'll get an additional $600 per week. So, uh, they will be reasonably happy too. And everybody will ignore what's gone on behind the scenes with that $425 uh, billion dollar, uh, with that appropriation, which will capitalize the $4.25 trillion leverage a lending facility um, at the Federal Reserve for these companies. You can call that TARP-2. This is TARP-2. And believe me, it's not going to stop with a $4.25 trillion lending facility. It'll probably be handled in some rotational way. So that over a period of time, people will be using $30 trillion in credit facilities to blow up these very, very, very large companies that are eating up the rest of the economy of the United States. So as Dave says, Trump's family can't get any bailout funds. So yay, yay. So, that's the way things are. Now, let me take a look at your comments. I hope you've been sharing. I, I think this was a real good one. I think the stream was pretty stable tonight, too. Kay says, I heard about this from her at Bernie's Town Hall online a while ago. Good idea. Doc, what's that huge scar on Biden's left forehead that nobody wants to mention? I don't know. I didn't notice the huge scar on his forehead. 
I wonder if it's uh, the after effects of some surgery he might have had. Steve might be the scar from his surgery f um, for an aneurysm um, but years ago. Oh, yeah. Steve says, ain't going to happen, Doc. We won't get shit. <laughs> Dale says, I'm not crazy about their wellness check um, idea. Well, if it's her bill and if it's administered by Bernie Sanders, the wellness check will be fine. Steve says, we're totally fucked. A total depression is our future. We are fucked. Get used to it, hey. Steve says, 1200 is a week's pay and won't do shit. We are quite fucked. Well, for a family, uh, it's going to be, what is it? For a family with two kids, it's going to be $3,400. And, of course, there's the unemployment. There's the unemployment. And also, speaking of the unemployment, it will be paid to them if they're put on furlough by the large companies. That will leave their medical insurance from the companies um, intact. So they'll still have their insurance, but they'll be collecting the unemployment insurance. And the twelve hundred dollars is just an upfront payment. And Lana says, for the elderly or the infirm, uh, many will die while hunkering down, okay, and no one will know. Uh what okay is your issue? Uh yes. Okay. It's going to be a problem for many people who are elderly okay, or infirm because they're still going to have some medical expenses uh, because their Medicare doesn't cover everything. And unless they pay for an expensive supplement and unless they have some additional support from their children, Uh, they're going to find it hard. And if their children are caught up in the recession or caught up in the depression, they might well have a severe financial problem. There's no Medicare for All involved in this. Okay. The other bill... Uh, handled expenses that were directly correlated to the coronavirus, I believe, and made the tests uh, free. Uh, but that's it. It did not provide the general care for other things during the time of the coronavirus emergency. Dale said, I'm elderly, I'm crotchety, I'd rather just be left alone, Lana. And Dale says, as long as wellness checks are voluntary, I'll be okay with it. If you want a wellness check, ask for it. Let's not go um, um, all random with it. I don't know what the language of the bill says. Steve says, will the coin counting machines at Vons accept the trillion dollar coin? Of course not. The trillion dollar coin is going to sit in the vault of the Federal Reserve forever. In spite of that, it'll go on their books as a trillion-dollar asset. Maybe someday when we get a lot more inflation, some company will be able to buy the trillion-dollar coin from the Fed. Who knows? Kay says, what I want to know is if you have had uh, the virus... Oops, look like my camera ran into another problem. Let me see if I can easily get it back. Yes, that was easy. Kay says, what I want to know is if you have had the virus and survive, are you then um, immune to it? No one seems to know for how long yet. They know that you are immune to it, 
um, but for a time, they don't know how long. Um, um, speculation based on the kind of virus that it is is suggesting to some people, okay, who are medical authorities, that it will be good for at least a year and that it might even be good for life. But no one knows yet. That's quite right, Kay. Uh-oh, Joe vanished. It's not clear yet. That's what I keep hearing, Steve. So many to find it. Yep, I see you. Testing blood infusion soon. Yeah, they claim to have been doing thousands and thousands of tests now that they're doing uh, 65,000 a day now or something like that. Um, I don't know. This is in part uh, coming from uh, from briefings from the Trump administration, of course, you know, Trump is lying about this like he lies about everything else. He lies about things until he gets uh, corrected by Fauci, and then he lies again. Steve says, this empire only cares about, okay, it's military, fuck its people, uh, let them die. Unfortunately, the military is exposed to the virus too. And Kay says, I just heard on Matto that a Telluride company is now doing blood tests, uh, um, but maybe they will figure it out. I think that they are going to have the tests, that there are going to be a lot of tests that will be coming up. The question is, once we've taken uh, the tests and it's determined who has the coronavirus, what are they going to do then? What are they going to do then? What's the next Step. Are they going to start tracking all of us? Are, are they going to track whether we're beginning to exhibit serious symptoms? If we get the serious uh, symptoms, are they in, then going to transport us to the hospitals and give us treatment and do it all for free? Or are they going to stick us with a huge bill and the hundreds of thousands of bucks and say, it's bankruptcy for you, Jack. It's bankruptcy for you. Steve says, if you flip the trillion dollar coin, does Biden get that uh, delegate? Which delegate, Steve? Jim says, easy concept, give everyone a temporary um, a UBI, then tax it back uh, the next year. If they don't qualify, yeah. Kay says, according to what I've heard about the bill being voted on, the poorest people will get zip, nada, especially we on low Social Security. I don't know yet. I haven't seen the language. Carmen said, I'm not old enough for SS. Will we at least get food stamps? I think you still get food stamps. I don't think the bill is going to affect that. Steve says, you ain't going to get shit from the government. Forget about it. Find a nice bridge to under. Jim said, I am being sarcastic. Bernie Sanders on fire on the Senate floor. And now I find some of my Republican colleagues are very distressed. They're very upset that somebody is making 10 to 12 bucks an hour, might end up with a paycheck for four months more, than they received last week. Yes, I know. Uh, Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, Senator Lindsey Graham, that favorite of everyone in the Senate. He is Bonnie's pet peeve. I mean, Bonnie thinks that guy is disgusting. <laughs> and who's, who's the third of their senators? Oh, yeah, Ben Sasse. He's from Nebraska. He says, that's much too generous. Well, what I suggest is this. Okay. What I suggest is that what we do is we take those benefits and we cost adjust them. We cost adjust them by regional cost okay, of living so that the constituents of Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott and Ben Sasse all get less because they they come from states that have a relatively very, very low cost of living compared to other places 
um, in the country. Let's see how they like those apples. Kay says, I get less than 700 a month um, SS and get a whopping 41 bucks food stamps uh, monthly. Well, let's see the language in this, Kay, and see if there's any more in it. Carmen says, that's why the DNC is able to override uh, the, uh, the Democratic um, but process. Jim Burt says, ask Pelosi about that pay-go logic of hers. I don't think she's applying pay-go to this $2 trillion bill. I think she's been taken off of pay-go by everybody. She didn't apply pay-go to uh, the ARRA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the stimulus bill of um, um, 2009. She didn't use Paygo for that. She forgot about Paygo for that. After that was over, all she wanted to do was Paygo. It'll be the same thing here. Next time around, she'll want to do Paygo. So Rashida can introduce um, a hub bill and she can say, look, Nancy, it's paid for. It's paid for by the frickin' platinum coin. In fact, okay, if I know Rashida, she'd probably say, look, Nancy, just mint the fucking coin. Carmen says, we just need one little honorable politician to pluck those deficit hawks feathers for good by coming forward with indisputable knowledge. I don't think it's going to be as easy as that. However, however, it seems Rashida is coming forth with that right now. And I think she's only the first. We'll soon be hearing it from AOC. We'll soon be hearing it from um, 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 Ilhan. We'll soon be hearing it from Bernie. If other people do it first, he'll start talking about it too. Maybe low-key at first. But he'll get there. He knows all about it. Kay uh, says, Bernie's trying his best, Carmen, but as usual, they aren't listening. Suddenly, they create money out of thin air. Fucking liars. Steve, what they're going to do with this is they're not going to create the money out of thin air for this. What they're going to do is hold the treasury auctions. And they're going to run up the debt. Uh, they're going to cancel the debt ceiling. And they're just going to run up the debt. And then sometime in the future, when the businesses have gotten theirs, and they are out of danger, and the economy has settled down a little, and the coronavirus is more or less gone, at that point, the Hawks okay, are going to be back. Okay, and they're going to say, uh, there's this huge debt. This huge debt. We can't possibly pay it back. Can't possibly pay it back. The only place to get the money is by privatizing Social Security and Medicare. And taking what's in the trust funds. That's what they're going to do. But they'll couch it in friendlier language. They'll talk about fiscal responsibility. So we have to start screaming now about what's really going on. We have to start screaming now about the platinum coin. We have to start screaming now about overt congressional financing. And we have to start asking in very loud voices... Why don't you just use overt congressional financing and leave your hands off my SS and off my Medicare? Carmen says, and suddenly no one complained about socialism anymore, not uh, the rich. Carmen says, yes, I know. Carmen said, the Treasury spending account is guarded by the fox of all foxes of the hen house, Steve Mnuchin, the rat. Yeah, former Golden Sachs rat. 
yes, Carmen and Kamala Harris should have locked him up. Yes, Carmen. Uh, Kamala Harris should have locked him up as his foreclosures in California were illegal. They're both crooked. Yeah, they are. And he paid her off. He paid her off with a $2,800 contribution. Last of the big spenders, right? <laughs> well, maybe he's given a lot of money to her packs. Who knows? Jim said, oh, I wish I could be clueless again. And New Hampshire Citizens for Progress, Fossil Fuel and Climate, Dr. Joel uh, Huberman and Dr. Uh, uh, Sam uh, Miller. Kay says, not me, Jim. I like to know who's making my life crap. GOP and corporate Dems have been doing it for most of my adult life. Lana says, jerk. Carmen says, um, ignorance is a blitz. And Wendy D says, yay, got it. And Lana says, Fed debt, roll it off and let it go. Bye-bye. Dr. Joe, have you ever sent this to someone in high government for consideration like to Bernie? I've never tried to send it uh, to Bernie. And the reason why is because um, 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 I know Stephanie knows this very well. And that she hasn't said it to Bernie or talk to Bernie about it because she doesn't think the time is opportune. Um, Stephanie is very careful how she introduces things to Bernie because it's not just introducing it to him, it's also introducing it to his staff and to everybody around in that particular group. She's been very careful about essentially playing the role of the very responsible financial advisor who has very new and novel ideas but is never irresponsible when it comes to pushing those um, um, ideas. Um, I'm afraid I'm a little too irresponsible and vocal when it comes to pushing my um, ideas. I think my personality is more similar to Rashida's than it is to Stephanie. <laughs> it seems to me Rashida just goes out there and hangs it out there. Well, that's good because maybe Bernie will be brave enough to start to hang it out there, too. Oh, well, I I have. Uh, it's been sent to Stephanie. I can't remember whether I sent it to Stephanie, but I am pretty sure that Lana has. I'm sure Stephanie is totally aware of it. Totally aware. Of it. I have no doubts about that. Because I've had highly visible blogs up about it. I've been blogging about it since the fall of 2017. It's two and a half years. Well, actually, uh, my last blog about it was in the, I think, in the late spring of 2000, okay, in 18. But I had a lot of blogs in between fall 2017 and the late spring of 2000, okay, and 18. And it's right on my site. It's there, okay, along with my book on fixing the debt. Uh, okay, at one time, the MMT people were very hot on the platinum coin. But after 2013... They wanted to put it on the back burner so as not to seem like they were the economists of a banana republic. That's what uh, the problem was. They wanted to minimize the, main, uh, the name calling from the mainstream. Steve says, 
Dying with the stars would be so much better than dancing with the stars. Prince Charles, can we vote? I vote thumbs down. <laughs> Prince Charles has never impressed me as a very nice man, has he? Jim says, TARP had very little oversight. They forced all the banks to take the TARP even when they did not need it. Kay says, Warren is GOB, is um, the GOP in disguise. It's not very good disguise anymore. Wendy D says, I believe Warren is dirty DNC. And Kay says, Wendy, she was GOP until the 90s, I think. Carmen says unkindly, good old Pocahontas. <laughs> Wendy says, yeah, she was a Republican. Yep, that's her comment. And Jim says, Warren isn't just dirty. She's a, a traitor to her country, dead to me. Me too, Jim. She was a ghost to me when she endorsed HRC over Bernie in 2016. Yep, a me too comment. Yep, me too. My phone won't let me like comments, so you all just know I like everyone's comments. Laugh out loud. Kay says, at this time, it's Dementia Joe. I refuse to hold my nose and vote for him. He's not well at all. I'm not going to vote for him. No, I am going to vote for him. He's obviously incompetent. He's even told people that his vice president has to be ready to step in the job because he's unlikely to be president for more than two years. He's told people that. He's told people that. It's incredible. He's told them that. What an amazing thing. Seems like at Karma and SMH, they've sold us all out and themselves too. Jim Bird says, Oh, my opinions and feels in no way will I vote for one liar and racist over another liar, okay, and racist. Hell no, Joe. And Carmen says, I have. Well, okay, everybody is. And Lana says, Stephanie can be pretty blunt sometimes on Twitter. And Lana says, um, um, I gave it to Galbraith for you. Yes, I remember, Lana. But wasn't uh, Stephanie the chairperson at that meeting? <laughs> yeah, she can be pretty blunt sometimes, okay, on Twitter. But for some reason, she's not been very blunt about overt congressional financing. And Lana says, Prince Charles has grown on me after Diana died. He seems to have gotten more human after that. I love that his, he walked his American daughter-in-law, who was biracial, down the aisle because her father couldn't make it. Uh, you know, I didn't even notice that. I suppose I would have felt, okay, a little better uh, being about him. So Lana says, uh, Stephanie wasn't there. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm sure she knows about it. I was making so much noise about it, though. She had to have known about it. I mean, I've tweeted it at her. I mean, I've certainly done that. Uh, so Lana says, that was in Philadelphia. She was sick. I have tweeted it to her in replies, okay, on numerous occasions. I think most recently, a couple of weeks ago. In fact, when I encountered her article, uh, I retweeted it on Twitter, okay, and I made a comment, and I shared... Uh, the OCF uh, graphic. So it was there for her to read. It was in her feed. For sure. Okay. I think we've reached the end. I don't see any more comments. So. I'm going to send good night. And thank you for coming. And thank you for staying. I see there are still 10 of you here. 
which is pretty good after two hours and two minutes. And so I'm going to end and post this up, okay, on YouTube. And I, I'd like to remind you, please go to my Patreon page um, on occasion. Uh, okay, it's at patreon.com uh, front slash Joe underscore Firestone. And please make a small contribution occasionally or even on a continuing basis. Lana says, to me, OCF makes perfect sense. Maybe we should send it to Pelosi. I don't think Pelosi would like it. I think she likes her pay go. She likes playing the austerity queen. Jim says, night, Joe and peeps. Lana says, good night. And Russ says, I came in late, but I'll rerun tomorrow. Okay, Russ. I think you'll enjoy it when you see it uh, tomorrow. Uh, some of my remarks may be dated by the voting that is taking place tonight. Anyway, once again, good night. And please share, share, share this out. Thank you.